Good evening. Welcome to the public talk entitled "The Use of Traditional Chinese Medicine or TCM and Other Supplements to Mitigate and Manage COVID-19." Jointly organized by the Georgetown Institute as Open and Advanced Studies (GEOS) of Wawasan Open University (WOU). University Tunku Abdul Rahman Utah Chinese Medicine Department, Lam Hua E Hospital TCM Division, and the Malaysian Chinese Medical Society of Epidemic Control and Prevention, or CMEC. We are honoured to have four prominent speakers, namely Tan Sri Andrew Shen, Chairman of Jaws WOU. Datu Dr. Neo Sun Bin, Managing Director of Sun Sun Group and a research scientist, Associate Professor Dr. T. Kian Kiong, the head of Utah's Department of Chinese Medicine, and Mr. Lo Lian Ho, Chairman of the Chinese Medicine Committee at Lam Hua E Hospital. I'm the moderator. Welcome. Before we start, let's go through some housekeeping rules. Today's webinar is being recorded. After editing, the video will be available in the JAWS, Utah, Sun Sun Group, and CMEC websites. You're welcome to share it with your colleagues and friends. All participants' mics are muted to enable the speakers to present without any interruption. If you have a question or comment at any point, please type it in the chat box on the screen. For questions on facts and figures, replies may be given in the chat box directly by our team. The team will also collate questions in related areas for me to post to the speaker concerned during the quick Q&A session, time permitting. I would like to thank the hardworking supporting teams from Dr. Neo's group, CMEC, Utah, WOU, and GEORS. Now let me briefly introduce our first speaker, Tan Sri Andrew Shen. Tan Sri, who, who is the chairman of GEORS of WOU, is also a pro-chancellor of Bristol University, UK, a distinguished fellow of the Asia Global Institute, University of Hong Kong. With a first class honours in economics from Bristol, he holds honorary doctorates from Bristol University and University of Malaya, and is an adjunct professor at both Tsinghua University and University of Malaya. A former central banker, and financial regulator in Malaysia, Hong Kong, and China. He is a prolific writer on global economic and financial issues. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much, Tan uh, Sri. It's a great honor for me to join this uh, stellar panel of speakers. My good friend, Dr. Neil Sun Bin, uh, Professor Dr. Tay, and uh, Mr. Lo Lian Ho, uh, on this very important subject on the use of traditional Chinese medicine and other supplements to mitigate uh, and manage COVID. <clears throat> We're not trying to uh, recommend any uh, um, specific medicine or as such. Uh, we really want to discuss, you know, what the experiences that we have and share our insights uh, uh, into how to uh, collectively fight this very important uh, pandemic. Now, as you know, until very recently, <clears throat> what isn't medicine had such a spectacular record uh, of science and success that traditional medicine everywhere has been relegated to a hocus pocus and primitive superstition. Uh, uh, as Harvard professor Ted Kapchuk uh, wrote in his uh, 2000 book, The Web That Has No Weaver, Western doctors tend to think that only Western medicine has a handle on truth. 
Now, traditional Chinese medicine received official government support in China uh, with many hospitals running Western medicine and TCM in parallel. Uh, in Hong Kong, for example, uh, most Hong Kong people tend to treat uh, uh, use TCM for minor ills, preventive, uh, for building up immunity and health, leaving serious uh, illnesses to medicine, uh, Western medicine or surgery. But as more and more universities with departments dedicated to TCM, such as the Chinese University of Hong Kong School of Chinese Medicine, Peking University of Chinese Medicine, more rigorous research is being conducted so that acupuncture and uh, examination of other ingredients are in herbs and animal parts used in TCM received more and more uh, acceptances, uh, not just in China or Asia, but worldwide. Uh, during the pandemic, the TCM was used and Chinese herbal medicine became widely uh, accepted, particularly you know, uh, within the, the community uh, as useful uh, in helping to mitigate some of the COVID infection or serious illnesses. Now, uh, as a result of uh, greater government support for traditional medicine, uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, has begun to take uh, more serious attention and its latest report uh, in 2019, 88% of WHO members have now undertaken formal acceptance of traditional and complementary medicine, TMCM, uh, which uh, would include herbal medicine and indigenous traditional cures. Although most Western medical specialists uh, cite the lack of rigorous scientific studies, funding, training, and education standards and protocols for testing on safety in use and production, the WTO is halfway towards creating formal policies and standards for TNCM. TCM practitioners are increasingly looking for proof of efficacy uh, in clinical trials. They often speak of the need for, uh, to modernize and standardize TCM. So in fact, nowadays you can take uh, uh, Chinese medicine uh, in terms of capsules or pills uh, rather than just uh, uh, brewing some herbs. TCM was given boost when uh, Tu Yo Yo isolated the artemisinin at the Chinese Academy of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Beijing for treatment of malaria and won uh, Ms. Tu the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2015. As one of the oldest cities in Malaysia, Penang has a strong tradition in TCM. Founded as a charitable hospital in 1884 by the Penang Chinese community, Lam Wai Hospital has been providing TCM care to the poor and needy. In 1977, with a pledge of ring it for ring it match by the then board chairman, uh, Penang's philanthropist, uh, Tan Sri Lo Bun Siu, a massive fundraising campaign was launched for the building of a non-profit modern Western hospital. But after the first intake of patients in 1983, the hospital continued to grow and is today the second largest in Penang with 440 beds. The TCM branch has also become more active and well-supported with many local TCM physicians trained in China. And uh, Mr. Lo Hian Ho will, will speak on that. The Georgetown Institute of Open and Advanced Studies is very honored to work with Lam Wai Yi Hospital, UTA, and CMEC to give this timely webinar. We are extremely grateful to Dr. Neil Sun Bin, Dr. Tay, and Lo Hian Hong for uh, co contributing their expertise uh, and uh, Tan Sri Ko Chu Kun for moderating us. From this effort, we hope that there will be more support uh, for clinical research and tests for TCM in Malaysia particularly in Lam Wai Yi Hospital and Uta Hospital. Uh, my wife and I are firm believers in TCM research and application, and we hope that this will benefit health and general well-being for all communities in Penang and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for a very good introduction uh, to set uh, everything in perspective. Now, I would like to invite 
that to Dr. Neil Sunbin by briefly introducing him. An entrepreneur with over 40 years of experience heading the Sun Sun Group, which is one of the largest in Malaysia uh, with 1.5 billion turnover. He is also a research scientist for almost 50 years uh, with a PhD uh, from uh, London, University College London in the field of uh, organic chemistry. He did post doctoral research at the University of Chicago, and he continues to lead the research group at the Sun Sun Group. A philanthropist engaged in social civic service, he is presently the director of the New Foundation, a board director of the Wawasan Education Foundation, or WEF, a director of both the Lam Hua Yi Hospital and the Uta Hospital. And he has also served in the past on the MOH Steering Committee on TCM, the Penang FMM Council, Penang Economic Council, Port Commission, and the NECC. Now, over to you, Sun Bin, to give your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Sri Paul. So, good, good evening, everyone. So, today I'm going to give you an overview of COVID-19 the infection, its timeline, and what kind of SOPs and supplements you can use to mitigate and manage this COVID-19 virus. But before I go there, I just two days ago or yesterday, uh, WHO announced that 5 million people have died from COVID-19. Now that is a very large number. It, it, and, but if the worst actually is the livelihood that has been lost, probably 20 to 25% of small and medium enterprises in Malaysia has closed down. And yesterday, shockingly, the EPF announced that only 3% of Malaysians have enough saving to retire. So even if you can, you can survive this pandemic, you may not be able to retire because you won't have enough money. So this is a very sad situation for our country. Okay. So the agenda today is when is going to be a next big, big wave post-vaccination? When is the COVID-19 going to be over? Comparing Malaysia with other countries with high vaccination rates, UK, Israel, and Singapore, we can learn something. Can SOPs, air treatment, goggles, sprays reduce the risk of infection? Let's look at the evidence. Are there other things you can do or we can do to reduce our risk of catching COVID? And more important, what? you need to do in case you catch COVID. Okay, all the slides will be at our group as well as Wabasan and uh, all the other uh, entities. So don't bother to, to take pictures or anything, just relax and you can download this presentation from our group, uh, our response to COVID-19, together with many other presentations we made. So when is the next big wave? Post-vaccination. Some people even ask me, you mean after vaccination still can get COVID? I say, of course. When is COVID-19 going to be over? So we compare with countries with similar vaccination rates, UK, Israel, and Singapore. Okay, so these are the countries you want to compare with. Singapore with 81%, Malaysia with 78, UK with 72, and Israel with 71. So this is the current situation in Malaysia. So we had a big wave just before Chinese New Year, and then we started vaccinating, and we became very serious in June. And then we have this huge wave where cases went beyond 20,000. And then we start, we continue vaccinating and the rates came down. So this is, this is what happened. We started vaccination early in February, but it was very slow. Then by <clears throat> July, we managed to hit about 10%. And by September, it's 50%, right? And we started booster jabs at the end of October. I'll come to that later. Okay. So now, the good news is the death rates went up very high because the number of cases is very high, but it has dropped to very low. So we've gone from about five, six, four, five hundred 500 down to 36 yesterday, uh, the day before. So death rates have come down, which is very good news. So let's look at the UK, what happened there. So they started vaccination in January when they were having a massive pandemic, okay? Right, they started vaccination in January. And by about <clears throat> April, they had done 10%. And by about 
July, they're down 50%. Uh, the, the bad news was that when they, you know, when they start vaccinating, they start opening up, yeah? So you can see what's happened here. So, so then they started booster jab in the end of September. And what we see here is a massive post-COVID, you know, resurgence, okay? And, and this is probably because they, so like if you go to UK today, there's no masking, the restaurants are full, pubs are full, everything. So that is what they've been doing. So they open up. And the reason why they can tolerate these high cases is, okay, before we go there, I just want to show you that the peak from the pre-vaccination wave to the current post-vaccination wave, start of it, the peak to the start of the wave is five months, five months, okay, yeah. So the reason why the UK can tolerate this is because the death rates have got, gone down from 1,500 down to 74, right? So that's good news. Now let's look at Israel. Israel was the first country to start vaccination at the end of last year. So they started in December 2020 in the midst of their pandemic, okay? And the vaccination rate reached 10% very early in January and it reached 50% in March. And uh, they started booster vaccination at the end of July. So they also have a massive COVID you know, resurgence, okay? And if you look at, again, the peak between the last pre-vaccination uh, period, the peak to the start of the next post-vaccination wave is six months. So UK was five months, Israel is six months. Remember those figures. Okay. Unfortunately, in the case of Israel, the death rates post-vaccination was very high. And they were just, you know, but now they've reduced it to nine. Okay, and you will see why soon. Okay. Now, Singapore had a different problem. Singapore had a massive problem with the dormitories. And they had massive problems last year. But they closed out the whole country. They shut down everything. And they managed to maintain the, the, the level to almost zero. Okay? Uh, almost zero. And they started vaccinating in uh, January. Okay? They started vaccinating in in end of January, and then they hit 10% in April and 50% in July, but, and they started a booster jabs at the end of September, but they have another massive uh, resurgence as well. And, and that's because when they, vis when they reach 75% vaccination, they say, we want to open up and live the virus. So that's what happened. So the rates are still going up in Singapore. It hasn't really come down a lot, yeah? So, they had a much longer uh, peak to, to next wave was because they didn't have the wave when they were vaccinated. They managed to keep that away. But today, they are among the highest in the world in terms of the per capita uh, uh, cases. And sadly, the number of deaths have also been going up, right? So remember, um, you know, 75% or more of Singaporeans are fully vaccinated. Yeah, let's, let's just take that in that context, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I will come back to this slide later, but I just want to compare the four of them. Okay, so this is uh, the so-called booster jab. So Israel, because they vaccinated six months earlier than us, they knew that the vaccines were not giving the long-term protection. So they started early August to vaccinate, and they have reached about 50% today. Uh, the UK, unfortunately, did not do that. They only start vaccinating in October. So they only reached about 10%. Singapore, similarly, have uh, reached 12%. So, so we can see clearly countries have done third jet and the countries haven't done so much third jet. Of course, Malaysia is only 1% right now. Okay. So this table shows you some interesting data. I, I concentrate on these two, in, the information here on the right, the yellow and the green column. Now, basically, if you look at Israel, the peak of the pre-vaccinated wave, okay, was in January 2021. And that's when they started vaccinating very, very strongly, right? So the, the cases came down. However, the start of the post-vaccinated wave was in July. You see, six months. That means six months after they started aggressively vaccinating, they had another wave. UK, same thing. They had the, the, the peak was in January. 
But because they were a lot more reckless, by June, five months later, they had start of another wave. Singapore, although they didn't have any wave in early 2021, but their vaccination started uh, in April. <clears throat> by September, April 2021, by September, six months later, they have a massive wave. So, so we have three countries which uh, kind of are different. They are highly vaccinated. Here's a common thing. Israel had a different way of doing things. The UK had a different way. Singapore had a different way. But all of them, from the start of the vaccination to the start of a new post-vaccination wave, was six months. So if we use that, when we look at Malaysia, so we started three to six months earlier, later than Israel, and three months and uh, earlier, uh, later than UK and Singapore. And therefore, um, we had our, the peak of our pre-vaccinated wave was in August. Remember, 20 over 1,000 people had it a day. So if you add five to six months, January, February 2022, very likely we're going to have another big wave. Now, of course, um, there are some things we can do about it, and hopefully the government will do that. Um, so this is a very important point. Remember this, we are not unique. All the other countries who are highly vaccinated share the same fate, but we are one cycle behind them because we vaccinated three to six months after them. So we can predict almost what's going to happen. So therefore, the important takeaway messages are both Israel and UK vaccinated the population three to six months earlier than Malaysia. The post current post-vaccination wave started about five to six months after the peak of the previous pre-vaccination wave. Israel started aggressively giving booster jabs at the end of July and have managed to reduce the current cases to very low levels. However, UK did not start giving booster jabs until the end of September. Currently, cases are still rising. So obviously, that's the difference. Singapore managed to keep cases low for most of 2021 by having very strict border and movement control. However, when they fully vaccinated 75% of their population in August, they started to open up. And now the, the cases are currently the, among the highest per capita in the world. Therefore, based on the above, Malaysia is likely to have our post-vaccination big wave in January, February 2022. However, if we start aggressively giving booster jabs now, not until January now, we may have a chance to avoid the next big wave. In, in his infinite wisdom, I think uh, our Minister uh, of Health, uh, Kairi, have started vaccinating the third jab for people that had Sinovac vaccines uh, after three months. So that's a very good start. But currently, we're only 1%. Okay, so this is a quick one to tell you that with the current uh, home testing and testing at the factories and office and workplace, um, the number of cases reported may no, no longer be correct because many people don't report. They just stay at home or they, if they think they report, they will, KKM will come and close them down, wear pink bands for everybody, you know, send them to quarantine centers. So many people don't report. So this is our current uh, hospitalization rate. So it's going down. As you can see with the vaccination going up, our cases are going down. Very good news. So you have to watch this. If when this curve actually turns up, that's when we're going to be in trouble, right? Right now it's on a downward trend. So we are okay. But watch this curve carefully. Don't watch cases, watch hospitalization. Okay. So this is just to show you that, uh, you know, okay. All right. Okay. So is COVID-19 going to be over soon? On September the 1st, young Brahma Kairi said that we have to accept that COVID is going to be here forever. It's going to be endemic. And we have to coexist with the virus. But more important is moving forward, a more enhanced level of contact tracing becomes very important. And you will see why. So you want to leave the virus? Make sure you know how to live. Otherwise you may not live. So what is the consequence of this changing from pandemic to endemic control? The government has relaxed travel restrictions, dining in restaurants, religious institutions, cinemas, gyms, everything. But I would like you to avoid gym because a person that's in the gym, it meets between five to 10 times more virus than a normal person at rest. So do not go to a gym if possible, yeah? Therefore, more likely that you come in contact with people with COVID-19 and who may be asymptomatic due to vaccination. 
Although death rates on serious diseases are falling, data from Israel seems to suggest a lesser decrease as compared to UK. We don't know why. Therefore, it is imperative that you improve your SOP, take precautions not to catch COVID-19 and become seriously ill or worse, die. Now, uh, in conclusion, COVID-19 is probably going to be with us forever. We will likely need to regularly take booster doses to renew our immunity, especially towards new variants. We need booster jabs as soon as possible to prevent the next big wave, possibly coming in January, February next year. So how protective is your current vaccination program? A lot of people say, oh, I got Pfizer, very good, no problem. So let's look at Pfizer, okay? So this is an Israeli um, experience because remember they were six months before us. So they look at the, the, the response of the vaccine over after six months. So their conclusion was six months after receipt of the second dose, the level of antibodies and humoral immunity response were substantially decreased. Decreased by how much? A lot. So you can see here, the average population had about just over 500 titers of antibodies when they started the second jab. After three months, it had reduced to 128, and then it slowly reduced. But more disturbing is that older people above 45 and over 65 had a much lower response. So younger people had about 1,000 titers. The older people only have half, 500. And by six months, for the people over 65, it had dropped to about 70. And that may not be enough to prevent you from getting COVID. So you can safely say that if you, you have you know, any kind of vaccine, after six months, you probably consider yourself not vaccinated. That's what Israeli have are now. They consider anybody that has two jabs not vaccinated. So you need to go for a third jab. So why? Because the research shows that the third jab can produce 10 times more antibodies than the second jab. And more important, 12 days after the booster jab, the rate of confirmed infection was lower in the booster group than control group by a factor of 11.3, 11.3 times less. And the rate of serious disease was even more lowered by almost 20 times. So if you have a chance to go for a booster jab, you have to go for a booster jab. Don't be stubborn. Any jab will do. Sinovac, Sinopharm, Pfizer, you can name it. One, a third jab is better than no jab. Okay, so please don't, don't be stubborn on this one. So what can you do to mitigate your risk of catching COVID-19? So I have to quote from Sun Tzu. If you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of 100 battles. Now, COVID is a very terrible enemy. He has already killed 5 million people and probably impoverished 50 to 500 million people worldwide. Nobody knows. So this is a very serious disease and our greatest enemy in our lifetime. I mean, recent wars have never killed 5 million people. COVID in one year killed 50, 5 million people. So let's, let's be serious about COVID. So what is this COVID-19? Coronavirus disease or COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, okay? Symptoms include mild to moderate respiratory illness to serious illness which requires medical attention. Older people and those with underlying medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease or cancer are likely to develop serious disease. However, anyone can get sick with COVID-19 and become seriously ill or die at any age. Of course, most of the death are older people, which is not unreasonable but you can die at any age. So let's look a little bit about the infection timeline. So at day one, let's say you were infected, you need about four or five days uh, for the viral to pick. Now on the day which a viral pick is when you're likely to show symptoms. But if nothing happens within another five days or four days, you have no more viral replication, okay? However, there'll be viral debris. Now, when your body detects all these live viruses and viral debris, it starts to mount an immune reaction, right? And because this is a kind of virus nobody has ever seen before, it's very strong in its reaction. So it can create what we call immune dysregulation, <clears throat> which is like an autoimmune disease and cause a cytokine storm, which is the main, probably the main cause of death today. 
So if you're able to prevent yourself going into the pulmonary phase or the cytokine storm, you'll probably be all right. So the challenge for us is to prevent ourselves from infecting people and to prevent ourselves from progressing to pulmonary phase. So category one, the MOSA category one and two, no problem, category three, four, five, you need to go to hospital. So remember, you are infectious probably from day two, but you don't know, you are asymptomatic. So by day five, when you have symptoms, you already had two days walking around infecting everyone. So this is the danger of COVID-19. You can infect people uh, when you don't even have any symptoms. And of course, people are vaccinated may not even have symptoms at all, but they can infect people from recent studies, okay? All right, so, <clears throat> so what SOPs, air treatment, gargles, sprays, can reduce this risk of infection? Okay, you have to follow MOH guidelines, huh? avoid crowded faces, have one meter, uh, you know, wear masks, uh, wash your hands when you're in public areas, don't meet in close in close areas, do outdoor meetings or by virtual meetings like today. And you remember it's an air uh, transmission disease. So you have to treat your air. So what we, our company, you don't have to look at this. If you want to look at these details, so click on this link later, uh, all this, how to make your workplace safer. But our indoor air quality standard for our company is a minimum of two fresh air change per hour. Now you have a split con, then you got zero fresh air change. So your mitigation is zero. If you have two air change, your mitigation is 60%. Carbon dioxide, 800 maximum. If you have more than 1,000, it's very dangerous. We also use plasma cluster or bipolar ions. We do about 1,000 to 3,000 uh, ions per cubic centimeter. You know how to do this? Just go to this website. Everything is there. From my experience, having this kind of air quality, we have been totally be able to present, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our workplace. We've got hundreds of people catching COVID, but nobody's actually spread it in our office. That's the most important, that you have to prevent the spread. So these are the indoor air quality that has been proven in our company to totally prevent spread. Okay, so no SOP can be perfect. So what else can you do to mitigate the risk of catching COVID-19? Remember, COVID-19 is an airborne disease. So it would uh, enter your body through your nose and throat. Can we destroy the virus there? So what can you use? Well, there's this providin iodine throat sprays and mouthwash, hypertonic saline, nasal spray and gargles, and steam inhalation. So this is hypertonic saline, just a fancy word for salt water, okay? So let's look at providin iodine, right? Providin iodine can be, has been used by disinfectant. But there are evidences, and you can look at the scientific. Thing. We have hyperlinked all these scientific papers. You want to know the details? Click on those hyperlinks. You can see for yourself. There are evidences that it can provide a protective layer over the nasal and oral mucosa so that the coronavirus cannot bind to the ACE2 receptor and prevent the entry. So it locks them out. Bovina iodine orally rapidly inactivate 100% of the SARS CoV 2 virus in 15 seconds. Okay, this significant drop in viral load remains for at least three hours in COVID-19 patients. That's very important because we use this for treatment as well, right? So if you go to a dentist today and you don't gargle with provident RD, there's no way a dentist is going to examine you. It is also recommended that self-administrated three times daily to reduce the risk of infection when compared with C. Significant absolute risk was 24% when observed for proven iodine in throat spray. Now, what happened here was that in Singapore, they had all these dormitory foreign workers. So they give them some throat spray, some they give ivermectin, chloro, uh, you know, hexoquinone or whatever. And then they look at uh, how many cases, right? And then they had a standard with vitamin C. So some they only gave vitamin C. So basically, the highest uh, risk reduction was just spraying uh, this, this spraying uh, proven iodine into their throat three times a day, uh, and 24% uh, was less than uh, vitamin C. I, I think, you know, um, other things like, you know, uh, hydroquinone and all this, uh, ivermectin was only about, I don't know, 10 or 20% max. Yeah. So that means a simple spray is actually more effective than if you took something dangerous like ivermectin. Yeah. Okay, so how about this uh, hypertonic saline? Oh, by the way, everything we recommend here can be got off the shelf in the pharmacy. You don't need the prescription. Don't go around the back of the 
hospital and somebody will not hospital, some back of the shopping center and somebody will give you a pack or something, right? You don't have this again available in every pharmacy. So a hypertonic saline nasal equation and gambling. Okay, H S N I G. So basically, uh, when you can virtually wash away the, the virus from your nasal cavity and pharynx and to prevent micro aspiration of the SARS virus into your oh, sorry, the SARS CoV-2 virus in your lung or early, they mean to prevent it going to your lungs. And the studies have shown that this uh, HSNIG can help in reducing symptoms and duration of illnesses by average of two and a half days. And the number of people uh, in the study that were you know, PCR negative is about double their control group. So you can look at all these papers there, here, right? Okay, how about steam inhal inhalation? Now, the evidence for this is not so good. It's because it's impossible to monitor how far are you, like this guy is using a totally different method from this guy, right? So how far are you away from it? How much steam there is? However, there are some evidence to show that steam inhalation can help uh, patients recover faster and uh, symptoms can be reduced. Yeah, so I, I leave you to decide. You can read for yourself, but I don't think there's enough evidence to say that for sure, yeah? So are there other things we can do to that we can do and take to reduce our risk of catching COVID-19, right? Besides those uh, mechanical things that spray and SOPs and all that, yeah? Now, I think the most important is that you must have enough sleep because if not enough sleep, your immune system will be lowered a lot. Eat a balanced diet, exercise. These are the most important things you can do. Exercise, eat balanced diet, and have enough sleep, yeah? However, can supplements like uh, vitamin C, uh, D3, zinc, quercetin, omega-3 fatty acids, and ling actually help you to mitigate the risk of COVID-19? Well, vitamin C is an oxidant, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immunosupportive. Uh, many, some studies show that it can help. Yeah. However, if you look at systemic review and you look at meta-analysis, it is not very strong the evidence that it can support uh, it can treat COVID-19 successfully. And in fact, KKM also agree with this. So you just take a low dose huh, for general health. Don't go crazy with it huh, because it's dangerous to you know, hyperdose uh, any kind of vitamins. Okay, how about vitamin D? Now this is interesting because they look at 20 European countries and look at the amount of vitamin D in the blood, right? And the number of cases. And they found that there's a correlation, a statistically significant P equals 0.03, on the number of cases versus the amount of vitamin D in the bloodstream. That means the higher the vitamin D in the bloodstream, the lesser the number of cases. However, there's no correlation with death because demographics matters here. You know, if you're a young population, you won't have so many people dying, the older. So we don't care about that. But number of cases, <clears throat> there is a correlation, right? So vitamin D has been used in the management of COVID-19. So you know, it, it favorably modulates the host response and uh, in both early and later uh, state phases, and lower mortality rates for older people when given a bolus, uh, uh, oral bolus uh, of vitamin D, it's quite high, it's really 80,000 IU, either, in, you know, so there, there has been mitigation of the 55%, right? So, okay. So what does KKM actually say? I think the most important statement for KKM is, most patients who have COVID-19 were vitamin D deficient. So please, don't be vitamin D deficient. Whether it cures COVID or not, it's not certain. But what is certain is that if you don't have enough vitamin D, your chances of getting COVID is much higher, as you can see from the European study and other studies. Okay, how about zinc? Zinc has many roles in the preservation of immune health and antiviral immunity and anti-inflammatory properties. Zinc deficiency uh, uh, causes an increase in production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. The cytokines are important because cytokine, you know, in the COVID it can go into cytokine storm and you, you don't want to have a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? During autoimmune disease. So zinc supplements should be considered for autoimmune disease patients with low serum zinc levels and high. So, so basically it works well for autoimmune disease. So it seems to work for COVID as well. Okay, so this is a study of 45 Asian countries. And this is a prevalence of zinc deficiency. So again, they found that the P value is 0.04, which means statistically significant. That means the more deficient your country is for zinc, the higher number of cases you have. Again, death is not uh, correlated because again, due, due to demographic. So zinc again is important. So people with zinc deficiency, high tendency of catching COVID. So don't be deficient in zinc. So what does KKM say? 
There were evidences that zinc sulfate may play a role in the therapeutic management of COVID-19. So KKM agrees. Okay. So how about fatty acids, omega-3? So you know what they are, right? DHA, EPA, ALA, important for the general health, has anti-inflammatory properties, reduce, but it can also reduce mechanical ventilation and death rates among COVID-19 patients. If you look at this uh, paper number one here, another large UK study that was using apps, people just using apps, showed that taking omega-3 probiotics, multivitamins, and vitamin D had lower risk of COVID-19 infection by 9 to 14%. So this is not a very good study, but it was a very large, there's a hundred, few hundred thousand people study, yeah. But more important is this, all right? Here we have a study that classifies the population into four quadrants. Those with low omega-3 in their body, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 with the highest omega-3. They look at people that were seriously ill, all right? What happened to them? For those in Q1, Okay, uh, 14 people died, uh, went, had to go on ventilation, 73% had to go on ventilation, and seven of them, 36% actually died. But when they look into the Q4, that means the people the highest uh, omega-3, only six people went to ventilation, or 33%, or less than half those with the Q1, uh, quarter one. And the death was only one, 5.6, so there were about seven times uh, less people dying. So what, what it means is that it seems that omega-3 will be useful uh, when you have serious disease, yeah? Okay? Okay, so how about things like flavonoids? I think you guys know what flavonoids. They are natural compounds found in vegetables and fruits. That's why your mother always asks you to eat more vegetables and fruits, right? So there's something called quisetin. Now, quercetin is an anti-inflammatory antioxidant and the JSIC, an anti-inflammatory compound, uh, is probably a potential treatment for several severe COVID inflammation, which is one of the life-threatening conditions in patients. Um, if you go back to the chart earlier, you see that inflammation actually goes up when you, the disease gets more and more serious. Quercetin is an important adjuvant capable of attenuating. This is, this is quoting from the research papers here, not my, my work. Uh, uh, that it can uh, likely slow the disease progression and indirectly underline once more the importance of herbal medicine for counteracting COVID-19. The cell is a lock, so it's even saying that the quercetin can glue the lock so that the key, the COVID-19 cannot open it, yeah? Okay, so what are the uh, results? So there is some research um, that shows that quercetin uh, can shorten the time of molecular test conversion from positive to negative, and reducing, and this is more important, reducing at the same time symptom severity and negative reduces of COVID-19. That means it seems to prevent you from getting serious COVID, yeah. Now, how about uh, TCM? Well, I will leave that to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Professor Day and uh, Mr. Lolian Ho. Your time to you about it. So, this is okay. However, I just want to bring out an uh, extract of a mushroom called Ling Tzu. Now, this extract is very high in polydoglycans, uh, polysaccharides, and triterpenes. It's used in China for treating autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus. So it has a very good immunomodulating effect. And we know that um, COVID, serious COVID is an immunomodulating, uh, immuno disease, right? So polysaccharides as well, immuno, immunosimulating. So it's anti-inflammatory. So we, we, we think it's, but there's not a lot of evidence. There are some studies that seems to indicate that uh, it is uh, very good for you know antiviral, immunomodulating, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, you know it's supposed to be the best in terms of uh, COVID nineteen prevention of different mushroom species. And then they also look at that it has uh, beta glucans and immunomodulatory properties, and it stimulates the production of antiviral cytokines. Again, cytokines are important because they cause the cytokine storm. So if anything that prevents them. It's a good thing. Okay, there has been one trial that's done on comparing Ling Tzu, or they call it by the Latin name Granoderma lucidium, right, with uh, COVID patients. So they compared it with human convalescent plasma. What is human convalescent plasma? It's the, it's the blood plasma from people that have recovered from COVID. So that's quite effective. So they look at the two antibodies, IgG and IgM. IgM is the one that, you know, starts, comes out first the minute you see a virus. That, what is strange is that 
patients that were given uh, Ling Zi, uh, did not have any, didn't have much increase in uh, IgM compared with patients with COVID-19. And for human uh, convalescent plasma, it's the same thing, very low level. But for IgG, uh, IgG is a long-term uh, antibody, yeah? and it's good. The higher level your IgG, uh, the less likely you're going to have COVID, right? We know that. So the patients with uh, high levels uh, with COVID-19 treatment had high levels of IgG, okay? Um, strangely, uh, human convalescent plasma did it because maybe it's so effective, it killed off everything, right? So uh, because it really has, the convalescent plasma has its own antibody, so maybe it's just effective in that sense. So, but the, the, the patient that has it, uh, that has um, COVID itself had lower than those who were, were treated with, uh, you know, COVID, uh, with uh, Ling Zi, okay? So that's, that's, I can't interpret this properly, but I think uh, this is a good thing. So they also look at the blood profile and they found that patients that were treated with Ling Zi had lower uh, white count, total white count. And, and you, you know, uh, you know, uh, Total white blood cell is an inflammatory uh, response. So the patients with COVID had 17, those with uh, Ling Zi only had 12, while the convalescent plasma had been lower at 9.4. Of course, convalescent plasma is a very good treatment for COVID. Yeah. Okay. So those are the... Th so what do you need to do when you catch COVID-19? I just want to say is that about for last month, about 22% of the people who died were born in dead. That means they died at home. They didn't know when to bring them to hospital, so they died at home. So what do you need to, to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, you need two equipment. One is the oximeter, and one is the thermometer. The minute you have COVID, you need to measure your oxygen saturation or temperature every couple of hours, if possible. And if you see the oxygen level dropping, especially below 90%, please go to hospital or CAC immediately. Do not treat at home with oxygen cylinder. Because COVID cannot be treated with oxygen alone. You need steroids, you need other things. So please go to the hospital if your oxygen cylinder, uh, your saturation drop below 90. But if your temperature is spiking high above 39 for a few days, I would advise you to go to the hospital CAC as well. Do not become a BID. 22% of Malaysians who died are, were BID. Do not be one of them. Okay, so we should inform you that there is no medicine vitamins, supplements, or herbs that is 100% proven to cure or prevent COVID-19. However, we'll give you some recommendations uh, on how, what you can do to mitigate the risk of COVID-19. Okay, so these are the recommendations we give to our friends and our staff and, you know. So normally, as we raised know, that in a normal situation, you should not be short of vitamin D. So just take a low dose of 1,000 IU. Remember the old view of given 80,000, 80, 1,000 is not high. Zinc, you take about 10 to 15 milligram, and vitamin C, okay, 1,000. You don't need to do anything else. Just, just take this. But if you go out and you have a party and you go dinner and all that, when you come back, please gargle or spray before with an RD. Spray seawater into your salt water into your nose, and if you like, you can steam. You can also take some cooling tea, supposedly preventive, but I, I leave uh, to my, my friends uh, to tell you about that. Right? So basically, you don't have to do much, but if you go out and you think uh, you should, uh, when you come back, spray with propylene RD and gargle and seawater, just to make sure if there's any virus in your nose or throat, that this probably will kill them. Now, what happens if you get COVID-19? Now, of course, you, if you got serious COVID-19, you have to go to the hospital, we really stay huh? So anybody, we get three, four or five, <coughs> Should we go to hospital? Should not treat at home. But if you are cat one and two, okay, you treat at home. So take increase the vitamin C a bit to 3000 milligram. Vitamin D increase to 3000 IU. The zinc increase to 75 to 100. Bovina iodine gargle three times a day. Sea water spray three times. Steaming three times. And then we give four capsules. This is what we give to our staff of Ling Tzu with 50% polysporic uh, content, uh, standardized extract. And we also recommend the setting three times 800 milligram, but you know, if you take two, it's probably okay. And you should go also for herbal tea uh, to either Lamwa Yi, Tongshit, or Utah Hospital or through the internet. Okay, so this is what we recommend. Now, the most important is that we do not uh, suggest that this can cure or prevent COVID. 
but the evidence show that some of these things may help. And for example, if you're short of vitamin D, you know your chances of getting COVID is much higher than somebody who wasn't. Same with zinc. And you know COVID I think can kill 100% of COVID. So what's wrong, right? So this doesn't necessarily mean it can cure or prevent, but it may help you to mitigate. All right, so thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sunbin, for a very clear presentation. Um, and you almost kept within the time, uh, but we started a few minutes late. So, okay, now um, questions. There are some questions that have come in. So I would like to pose to you uh, one by one. Um, the first one is that um, the data you presented you know, in terms of uh, the waves and all that, uh, um, would, would it have something to do with the type of vaccine being used in each country? Would you no. like to comment on that? Okay. Um, you know, this is a very sensitive question. And frankly, my reply has always been, any vaccine is better than no vaccine. Okay. Um, but... It's going to be difficult for me to say which vaccine is better. Mm -hmm. My view is, if you can get a third jab, go for it, no matter what. Right. Because that is more important. I, I don't think I want to speculate which vaccine is better. But of course, we can see you know, relative death rates are different for different vaccines and all that. But I think that is just nitpicking. The most important, get a third jab. Don't think about it. You know? Don't think about what vaccine. Just take the vaccine, whatever vaccine is available. That's the only thing I can say. Very good answer. Thank you. Now, um, any statistics uh, on India, uh, how India has been handling, because at one time it was out of control, but now it seems to have subsided. Uh, what is their strategy? Is it vaccination or what? I'll just give you a simple statistics and that should answer your question. They tested the people living in Delhi. They found that 90% of them had COVID antibodies. What's that mean? They, they haven't vaccinated 90% of people, probably less than 50%. And not more than 50% of people obviously had COVID. So what it means is that almost everybody in Delhi has been exposed to COVID. Some of them caught it, some of them didn't catch it. So what they are doing is actually they have, they have reached herd immunity. Mm -hmm. I would say safely, I don't know about other parts of India, but if you say that 90% of people have COVID antibodies in their blood, they have reached herd immunity in Delhi. But I'm not sure about other parts of India. Okay. So they have done two things. One is they vaccinated as many people as they can. And the other is they allow as many people as possible, not allow, they, unfortunately, many people caught COVID. Yeah? And then they became immune. And then those who didn't get COVID were exposed to COVID, but their immunity was strong enough to fight it off. But they also got the antibodies. So you can also get antibodies, you know. Like that, that day, a friend of mine said, showed me a result and it was very high. And I said that you may have been exposed to COVID, right? Because you can be exposed to COVID and not catch COVID, but you can, your, your antibodies can go up. Yeah. So India is probably a mixture of vaccination. Uh, of course, people say ivermectin and all that. I, I will not, I haven't seen evidence to 100% prove that. It, it may help, but. Proving is another thing else, right? I mean, it can probably help, but not, not for sure, right? But since 90% got, um, you know, antibodies, they don't have to worry anymore, right? Okay. Well, uh, is that related to the type of food that you take, for example, in India, because uh, they take curries, they take all, all kinds of... Uh... <laughs> uh, please, do not think like this, I think. Um, because if the Indian food was that great for mitigating COVID, you know, they wouldn't have the highest number of COVID patients at one time in the world, right? They had the highest infection rate at one time. No, don't think any food can mitigate COVID, right? The most important, you must follow SOP. You must get your third jab, assuming you already have been vaccinated. If you haven't, then you're taking a high risk. Uh, take a third jab, uh, sleep well, eat well, exercise, you'll be fine. No, no, no food I know can stop COVID or prevent COVID. Yeah. Okay, there's one question which is asked by a lot of people, uh, um, common people. Uh, what do you think of 
ivermectin. Is it effective? Okay. To be honest, I've been looking at ivermectin since last year. And, and one time I, I had, you know, look at the meta analysis and I was quite confident that it will work. Um, but unfortunately, I think the problem with things like ivermectin is the way it is kind, kind of marketed. You know, and, you know, people think that it's a wonder drug, that it will cure COVID and you will never die if you take ivermectin. That is not true. If you do a lot of research, like even the one that was done in Singapore among the dormitory workers, ivermectin had lower efficacy than the spraying, uh, just spraying with uh, you know, provident iodine. So I, I don't think ivermectin is a miracle drug. It may help, but it's definitely not a cure. Okay, I, I don't think anybody could say it's a cure. It's not. Yeah. Okay, now back to vaccine. Eh? Uh, is it safe to take a different make of vaccine for the third jab, for example, as recommended by the minister? Um, uh, Pfizer, uh, the third, uh, for those who, are, who have taken Sinovac? Okay. I think if you look at the data from Thailand and all those guys who have done a lot of heterologous uh, vaccination, um, they seem to induce more antibodies. But it all depends. Like for example, there was a study saying that if you had... Um, um, you know, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and you vaccinated with, uh, you had a third jab with Pfizer, you know, a booster dose with Pfizer, it seems to work very well. But if you have Pfizer and you took Johnson & Johnson, it, did, it doesn't induce so much antibody. So there's still a bit of a confusion. But my, again, my answer is, look, there's nothing stopping you from taking another jab in three or six months time, right? So whatever, you see, right now, if you're three months after you're vaccinated, if you're over 65, your antibodies are probably around 50 to 60 titers, right? And you're on the borderline, right? Would you rather take something that could increase it to 200 or you want to wait for something that increased to 2000? I would take the 200 first. Then if I think later there's a better one, I'll take a better one. Remember, right now, the most important thing you need to do is to get a third dose because it's proven to increase it by 10 times the antibodies and the chance of getting is reduced by 20 or 11 times, all right? And death and serious disease reduced by 20 times. I mean, there's no, nothing better than that, right? No medicine can do that. So go for your third dose. Don't care what dose. But of course, I personally believe in heterologous vaccination, but the evidence are not 100% yet. So I dare not uh, put my neck out, you know, and say that, yeah. But yeah, after but then, a while... Uh, there's a question that, WHO seems to be discouraging the mix uh, cross uh, vaccine, but uh, why does KKM suggest to you know, cross? Yeah, but because WHO uh, have looked at all the data and they found that some heterologous vaccination, like I just say Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer, uh, sorry Pfizer then Johnson and Johnson didn't seem to work so well. So if they look at the overall picture they may not see a, a, a conclusive one. But if they look at specific, like for example, you had Sinovac and you take a Pfizer vaccine, I think there's enough evidence to show that that will greatly increase your antibody uh, titer in your body. Okay? Right. So it will depend case to case. We can't have a blanket thing. You know? There's no blanket thing, right? So I think it's not fair to say that WHO is wrong and it's not fair to say Malaysian government is wrong. It's in what context? I think... Sinovac, people getting Pfizer is absolutely okay. All right. Thank you. Now, um, what is the time period between the third dose and the second dose? Uh, in China, they haven't give, even given the third dose. Okay, you see, I, I think at the moment, Malaysian government is saying that you need to, uh, if you have Sinovac, you need to do it three months. Uh, but if you had... Uh, uh, Pfizer, you have to wait six months, provided you're over 60 years old. That's what the government is doing now. But if you look at these charts here, obviously after six months, uh, the amount of um, antibodies, nitronizing, neutralizing antibodies, by the way, are the antibodies that bind to the virus and kill it, right? So it has dropped about three folds, you know. It means drop from about 500 over to 100 over. So I would say that anybody, uh, you know, after three months, 
can be given a, a, a booster jab. But of course, we have to be careful with the sense that we don't have enough jabs to give to everyone. So we have to work on the right-hand side chart here. That means all the people are really very vulnerable because they are down to less than 100 after three months, uh, after about four or five months. So we need to concentrate on them first. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, uh, we have only uh, one more minute. Uh, there's a question about uh, the quality of the supplements that you have recommended um, over-the-counter brands, are they as good as uh, MLM, multi-level marketing brands, or do we have to seek pharmacist advice? Uh, you know, I always thought MLM was a bit of a, I, I don't know whether to say it, uh, it's a bit of a money-making uh, entity. I would say that if you want to take anything, uh, make sure any herbal medicine, make sure it's standardized, you know, uh, like for example, the Ling you know, I, you know, if you take just the Ling with no standardization, it's probably useless. So you have to have self standardization. I mean, standardization is important. But of course, you bought COVID and RD and all that is vitamins, no problem. All the vitamins are the same. They all probably come from the same. You know, people ask me which brand you use. I say any brand because I'm sure the vitamin, the, the components are coming from the same factory anyway. So it doesn't matter. So I would say if you want to use, um, you know, I mean, most of the things I recommend, except the links are standardized anyway. It doesn't matter. You know, you buy Quercetin, it's either 500 milligram or 800. You buy vitamin C, it's either 500, 1,000 or 2,000. You know, so all of them are standardized. So it's okay. I don't think you should care about brand. Right now, it's like vaccine. Don't care about brand. Have some vitamin D is better than no vitamin D. Okay. Okay. Right. Good point. Thank you very much, uh, Sun Bin. So Thanks. now we move on to uh, Professor, uh, Associate Professor Dr. T. Ken Kiong. Um, Subin, can you unshare yeah, I'm your... I'm trying to okay. do that Thanks. now. Yeah, well, he's the head of department of the Chinese Medicine Division of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences uh, of Utah. And he also uh, holds honorary professorship and visiting professorship in two universities in China, uh, Shanxi University of Chinese Medicine and Dalian Medical uh, university, and he's the founding president of uh, the M uh, CMEC that I mentioned before, and he is a member of T and CM Council of the MOH in Malaysia, and he has been very active in promoting and developing Chinese medicine in Malaysia in cooperation with China and uh, ASEAN countries. Now over to you, uh, Prof T. Yeah, thank you. That's really cool. Uh, let me share my slide. So I will share about the role of TCM in the management of COVID-19. So I think uh, Dr. Nyo gave us very uh, informative about the COVID-19, about how about uh, in our body and on day one until day uh, maybe 10 or two weeks ago uh, after that. So today I'm, I'm talking about the TCM and COVID-19. So I, I will show you about three topics uh, for this 45 minutes. The first one is about the TCM activity with COVID-19 in Malaysia. And the second is about the reference understandings of COVID-19 between TCM and Western medicines. And the third one, I will show you about the TCM telemedicines for COVID-19. So I will share uh, topic by topic. So for the first one is about the TCM activity with COVID-19. So uh, we have a one task force we call Chinese Medicine Task Force for Malaysia COVID-19 was founded at last March. So we have five uh, uh, organizations to group together to form this task force, which is a uh, Utah Department of Chinese Medicine and then Utah Chinese Medicine alumni. And then we have a committee of TCM experts affiliated to the education society between Malaysia and China. And we also have well, alumni of Beijing University of Chinese Medicine. And we, we, we also have one member from TCM College of Xiamen University, Malaysia. So this is our task force which from in last year. And we, we have, uh, why we have this kind of idea to form this task force? Actually, we have uh, some reason to do so. So for, for the first one, is a misunderstanding of a Chinese medicine for the COVID-19 for the public. They don't know, uh, is this a workable? Is this a, a science proof or this kind of a, a, a issue from the public? This is the first one. 
And the second, it actually is from our own Chinese vaccines, professionals or personnel. And because they, are, they cannot confirm the effectiveness or how uh, that the TCM work with COVID-19. So this is a sec second one, is an uncertainty of a Chinese medicine for the COVID-19 from a Chinese medicine professional. So th because of these two issues, we form the task force. And until this uh, January, uh, our legal uh, advisor told us it's better to form uh, to, to, to have a register under our Malaysia Registration of Society. So in this January, we form Malaysia Chinese Medical Society or Pandemic Control and Prevention, which we can call CMEC, was from that. And this the task force for all the TCM activities linked with COVID-19. So you can try using your phone to scan the QR code, then you can get more information. So uh, this is our objective to form uh, our CMEC. So we try to use to, to promote and implement the application of a Chinese medicine in the prevention, treatment and recovery of an uh, epidemic or others kind of uh, uh, we call like the uh, communicable diseases. I mean, right now we are working with COVID-19. If in the near future COVID-19 is controlled, then maybe we will look for the dengue or this kind of uh, other diseases in Malaysia. So this is our objective to form this kind of uh, uh, organizations. And we look for another one is about uh, our medical advisor. We have a medical advisor and then we also have a legal advisors and also we have IT advisors. So the IT advisors also play a very important role for our society because they, they help us to, to build the website and then let the people to reach our advisor, medical advisor. The first one is our uh, deputy writer of Kuang Tong. Provincians, uh, provincials hospital of traditional Chinese medicine, who is a leader of a Chinese medical expert team from China to Malaysia for last uh, April uh, to May. So this is our first advisor. And the second advisor is a uh, Professor Shang Tong. Professor Shang Tong actually is a deputy director of a Lei Shen San Hospital. We know uh, very famous from the Lei Shen San and Fo Shen San Hospital in Wuhan in that time. So he is a deputy director from the Lei Shen San Hospital. And then we, we also have uh, others advisor from uh, Guangzhou. And we also have uh, advisor from Beijing, deputy director of Guang Amen Hospitals of uh, China Academy of Chinese Medicine Science. So uh, our professor uh, Li Wenliang. And also we have a uh, medical advisor from Hebei Yiling Hospital. So this is our medical advisor that give us very uh, informative and give us a uh, very big support for us to run off run all kind of activity about the TCM uh, with COVID-19. So we look, and then we have a media platform. So you can scan or just, when you log in your Facebook, just key in CMEC21. So we have uh, this kind of, uh, we have two Facebook account. Uh, the, this is a CMEC, another one is a Chinese Medicine Task for Malaysia COVID-19. So we have two. So until today, well, we, 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 we give, more and more information about the Chinese vaccine and COVID-19. So we threw this media platform to let the public know about the Chinese vaccine and COVID-19. So until today, our patch with uh, view is approximately uh, 60,000. Uh, 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 and then our total impression is about, uh, will be reached uh, 700,000. And total reach is about uh, 500,000. And then our post, engagements about uh, 50,000. So this is, we use this kind of a uh, Facebook platform to let the public know about the Chinese vaccine and the TCM, uh, TCM and the COVID-19. So we use this, this platform, it's very important for us. So uh, this one is about our guideline. Actually, we try our best to produce two guidelines. This guideline is about the safety guidelines for the Chinese vaccine uh, personnel, which we read all the uh, management guideline from a MOH, and then we pick up some the, the important information from them, and then we try to trans transfer from English or Malay to Chinese to let the Malaysia Chinese medical personnel to know about the safety because we are believe um, TCM as a, in the MCO one and two we are considered as an essential service, but MCO three we are not, but we are thinking. It's very important for the Chinese medicines, all the workers, they must, must be safe first 
Otherwise, we cannot uh, uh, serve other people. So we have this kind of uh, idea. We come out with this uh, safety guideline. In this safety guideline, we have a three part. The, the first one is uh, general information. The second part is about the medical information. The third part is about the TCM information. And in the TCM content, we have an uh, idea of a uh, minimize contract module to run the shop and the zero contact to run the shop. So we have this kind of two, two, two kind of idea in that time. So it is workable uh, until today because when you know uh, you know this is a COVID-19. So sometimes we are not easy to direct contact with a patient. So we use like teleconference to help the people with a COVID-19. So this is our the first guideline. So we'll look for the second guideline. Second guideline is about the Malaysia COVID Chinese vaccines uh, practice for the COVID-19. We have one and two, and you can scan the QR code, then you can download uh, from our website. So this is a second. Uh, we have first in last May, after uh, we have uh, advice from our medical advisor, then we, we, we published the, the first version in last May. And then after that, we have uh, experience to, to serve for our COVID-19 is more than thousand. Then we revise our, first trial version, then become the second version. So after we have to serve more and more COVID-19 patients, as more is, is more than 5,000 COVID-19 patients, then we based on the second, we revise it to be the, the third version. So uh, third version we are using as uh, papers, we publish in the journals of Beijing University of TCM journals as a papers, so you can scan, but this one is purely in Chinese, uh, uh, version. So we, we are using this kind of uh, Chinese medicine practice guideline for COVID-19 in Malaysia. So we use this as a protocol to serve all the COVID-19 patients in Malaysia, which who are quarantined at home. Uh, this is our main uh, target group of uh, COVID-19 patients. So we look for another one is about the Norwegian drive. We work with many uh, NGO. So we are believe in last, I think in last March, uh, our medicals is uh, uh, supply is very uh, is very hard to get it. Like the uh, N95 face mask and three layer surgical mask, this is very shortened in market. So we will try ourselves. We are we are thinking uh, to fight with COVID nineteen. It's not just a Western medicals doctor or uh, medicals other medical worker. It should work together with uh, Chinese medicine and also others, uh, others organization for the society. So we try our best, uh, let the people in China or the Malaysia in China send all the medical supply to the Guangzhou. Then we try our best to get all the, uh, uh, the item from Guangzhou to Malaysia. So it's about uh, more than 300,000 of Ringgit Malaysia for this kind of uh, medical supply. So we send to the hospital of Salayang and also we send to the uh, Slango states of uh, our health department and also we send to the KL hospital. So we try our best uh, to help the medical uh, staff. And we look for the other one is about the exchange. Uh, we have a chance to have a webinar with the Laysian Sun Hospitals team. And also we have a chance to work with our Nijin uh, 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 from the Guangdong and they come to Malaysia. Then we have a opportunity to talk and then they have a share their experience to us, how we make our own protocol and then what kind of uh, uh, precaution we need to understand and to to handle with a COVID-19 patient. So this kind of a very important experience all is come from them to help us and then that, that us to grow. Yeah, so this is a very important. Uh, beside this one, we also try our best to conduct the talk to let the Malaysian Chinese medical practitioners, uh, let them know how our society CM, CMEC to use the internet platform to help those COVID-19 patients at home. So this is our exchange between overseas expert and also we, we use our experience to share with the Malaysians, locals, TCM practitioner, the let them knows we can travel best to you also our, our method to help our people. Then we look for this one, 
uh, we have a talk and then I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best. I go to the ATV live interview program to talk about the COVID-19, to talk about the recovery of COVID-19. And also in some newspaper, I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to let the reader know about how is the Chinese vaccine work with COVID-19. Let the people know about more and more uh, understand about the Chinese vaccine with COVID-19. So we look for, I think this is a activity in, in the last part is about the herbal drinks or Chinese herbs. Uh, up to now, at least 6,000 cents for herbal drink or Chinese herbs has been provided to the public. So which include 200 healthcare workers in hospital Minturu. And this is a approximate 5,000 registers were related to COVID-19, which is a COVID-19 con close contact or COVID-19 patient or discharge COVID-19 patient. So we, we are still working for this one uh, from the last March until today. So we try our best uh, to improve our service and then we try to use internet technology to help us uh, to do this kind of activity. So this is uh, our, we also work, work with uh, Baking Tongan Tap. In last, in last, I think October, they have, uh, in, in Banan Sungai Dong, this is a, a red zone. They have a cluster in Banda Sungano. We work with Peking Tong Tong Tang, and then we free uh, to distribute this kind of a herbal drink to the Sungano residents. It's about 108, uh, 108 residents to claim for this uh, free complimentary uh, herbal drink. So this is uh, our activity. Uh, work with the company, work with the herbals or any TCM company. So we, uh, this is the last one about the TCM service in the private low list COVID-19 quarantine and treatment center, which we call PKRCS. Okay, so this is our first time uh, they have a TCM teams go to the PKRCS. So we try our best, we must wear the PPE and then we, uh, we talk to the patient and then we ask the patient to them and then we, we try our best to help them. So in this uh, PKRC, in, in, in the Unicorn Hotel, we also uh, admit from the uh, foreigners. This is our first foreigners. And then he also uh, okay to use a Chinese medicine. And then after a few days, he feel very good. After that, uh, he, he, he went to Johor. So and then in this uh, center, we also have a Chinese medical, uh, medical consultation room. So we have one room. Uh, to let the COVID-19 patients go to this consultation room and then we have uh, our TCM way help them uh, from use the herbs uh, from the timing. Okay, so this is the first part. Then right, uh, for the timing, I will share with you about the difference understanding of COVID-19 between TCM and Western medicine. In this topic, we have uh, another three subtopics. The first one is about the understanding of COVID-19 and the second one is about the treatment for COVID-19. And the third one is about the treatment protocol for COVID-19. So we will use these three sub topics to understand for this uh, area. So the first one is uh, understand the, about the COVID-19 for two reference kind of a system of uh, medication. The first, I think uh, we know this is a communicable disease. I think this is no doubt from both uh, medical uh, system. And this is called the sars cov uh, two virus. I think this is also is, this is, this is not a very big problem. And for the Western, they are trying to find out the drug to kill the SARS CoV 2 uh, virus. So, this is an idea from the Western medication. But for the TCM, we are not looking, we, we, we have an, another understanding about this one. So, we will look for the pathogenic factor. So, we say in the Chinese uh, E2. And also, we believe when, when last uh, March, the expert in China, they are looking, they uh, observe many, many of uh, COVID-19 patients, and they conclude that because the tongue presentations, uh, they believe the COVID-19 is, is related to the Shi Tu. In, in English, maybe we can say this is a dentist uh, problem. So this is the idea. And then because in the Wuhan, Wuhan in, December until March, the weather is cool. So the expert uh, consider that because it's a cool and dampness to cause the COVID-19 from a view of a Chinese medicine. 
But in Malaysia, we, we are, our weather is uh, hot and raining. So we believe this is not because the cool, cold and dampness. That's because it's the dampness and the heat. So we have a different kind of understanding. Uh, although this is the same diseases, but because this kind uh, from different kind of uh, area. So we have uh, this different kind of uh, understanding about uh, the COVID-19 from the TCM view. So from the TCM, in China, they did many, uh, many things in the prevention, management, and recovery for whole durations uh, of COVID-19, all is include TCM inside there. So in the view of TCM, we are not just looking for the virus. We are also looking for the immunity of our body and also pathogens. That means internal and external. So this is a difference understanding between two medical systems. So we can say Chinese medicine, we look, the COVID-19 is from macro vision. And the Western, they are looking for the uh, micro vision. So this is a two different uh, system to look for the COVID-19. And right now we are talking about the treatment for COVID-19. So Western medication, they are trying to find out the single compound drug to kill SARS-CoV-2 for the time being. But for a Chinese medicine, if you have an understanding about how we look for the COVID-19. So we look that because the cool dampness or dampness of heat, so we are trying our best to use the combination of the Chinese herbs to solve this kind of problem. And also we are uh, intervent FTD in the prevention, treatment and recovery of COVID-19. So this is a, a something difference between the treatment or interventions or preventions between two medical system. And for the Chinese medicine, we are not just using the herbs. We In China, they are also using acupuncture, tuina, and pa tuan ting, qigong, and extra, uh, extra to in, in a measurement of COVID-19. So this is a two different understanding and also two different treatment way uh, for the COVID-19. So right now, we look for this uh, 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 flyer, this from the our MOH. We look for prevention is better than cure. That because MOH they, they know after we got the COVID-19, we have a long COVID post-COVID symptom. Uh, for the time being, maybe from the medical Western maker, they cannot explain how we have this kind of a long COVID, this kind of a symptom. But in from a view of Chinese medicine, this is very easy to explain for the TCM theory. So we have a method to help the people, especially for the long COVID symptom. Uh, like example, they have a fatigue, they have a cough, uh, soft tooth, this kind of thing, or diarrhea. This is very easy in Chinese medicine. We can prescribe maybe uh, one week or two weeks, the symptom will be uh, mitigated is very quickly. So this is an idea. And this is a, the difference, big difference between two medical system. Every for this one, this is a Western medical treatment protocol from our government's uh, manage, management guideline in Malaysia, uh, num number five. This is Annex 2E. So we look for this one. Uh, left hand side is before 13 of August. The right hand side is uh, after 13 of August. This, there's a, a slightly difference uh, from before August. There is no treatment required for CAT1, CAT2, and CAT3. But after the 18 of August, I think this is improvement. There's no need for CAT1, but CAT2 and CAT3, we can try the supportive and symptomatic treatment. I think this is a better way. And then we can look for this one. They, they use other uh, drug uh, for the CAT3 uh, patient. And we look for this one. This is a CAT4. They use other medications. And CAT4, 4 and 4B. And then we also can look for the CAT5. Uh, we must use the medical, uh, the ventilations, yeah, for for the patient. So this is a treatment protocol for the Western medication. Uh, when we look for this one, I have uh, one, two, three questions. The first one is why we can accept to use those drugs that they are not proven to cure COVID nineteen in the state number three, two, and four. So this is the first question. Um, we, we can think about this one. And the other two, can we give the intervention is in the all stage of COVID-19? 
not just in the stage number three, four, and five. I think we can look from this aspect when we have a COVID-19, the life is more important, the life is priority than the COVID-19 virus. So we are trying our best to save the life of the patient. We are not in the in the state number three, four, five, we, we are not talking about how to kill the virus, this kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for this one because the life, we are not just focused or in the virus, COVID-19 virus, we, we must think about this one. Uh, it's more important, we try our best to save a life. And can we accept to use other medications such as TCM in all uh, stage of COVID-19 to avoid any deteriorations? So this is the idea. So uh, from our experience, we are trying our best to give the Chinese herbs to those isolated at home. So they are at home, they are cat one and cat two, some of them maybe will go to a cat tree. We also help them uh, before they go, uh, go to the hospital. So this is an idea. So we look for the uh, protocol about the TCM practice guideline for the COVID-19. Uh, in our idea, we have a different kind of a practice guideline. If you look for the China, they have uh, eight trial version for, of the TCM practice guideline for COVID-19. But in Malaysia, our CMEC, we try our best to produce until now is a third version. So we have a pre-COVID-19 and COVID-19 during, during, during the COVID-19 and post-COVID. So we look for this one. For the pre-COVID-19, we will have uh, our prescription for a red zone residents. And also we have uh, our prescription for COVID-19 contact person. And we have also for prescription for step one, two, three, and four, and five uh, for the COVID-19 patient. And also we have uh, our uh, prescription for the post-COVID who suffer like the cough, fatigue, uh, diarrhea. Yeah, so this we have uh, this kind of uh, practice guideline. So we look for the first one, for the pre-COVID, for the red zone residents, we are using five-leaf drink. For the COVID contact, we're using Lianhua five-leaf drink. For stage number one, so we will look back the medical protocol in the stage number one, they have no treatment required, but in the view of TCM, we need to do something. So we give them five-leaf drink plus sunburn decoction. So this is from the stage number one. Because we are state number four and five, they are all in the hospital already. So I, I'm not so the state number four and five. So for the state number two and three, if a state number two, they have a normal cough, we give them to the soul sun plus sun run decoction. And if the heaty cough, we give them sun chi ying plus sun run decoction. If there's a soul true, we give them ying chao sun plus sun run decoction. If the high fever, they've been uh, above 38.5, we give them ying chao chai ke decoction. So this is uh, our practice guideline for COVID-19 in Malaysia and used in our organizations to give for uh, to give this kind of uh, medic TCM drug to the COVID-19 patient. And after, if discharge, after discharge, they have a problem like coughing and fatigue, we will give them xiang sa liu jun zi plus zi so san. If they have a problem in fatigue and diarrhea, we will give them uh, sending by two sun. So this is our practice guideline for COVID-19 in Malaysia. Okay, right now I will talk about the TCM Terry Maxon for COVID-19 patient. I think this is more important uh, uh, topic for today. Uh, before April this year, we using online form to give the uh, our public to fill out the form and then we will submit the form then we receive a form then we will get them and then we will call them call them after to confirm all the information then we will prescribe the herbs for them after this april we use our website if you are free you can try to type my tcm.my we're using this website uh, which is help from our it advisor help us to build this uh, website so in this website we need the COVID-19 patients to key in the particular information and all the symptoms, all the COVID-19 symptoms. And also we, we need the public or the COVID-19 patient to upload one time image and sign for disclaimer. So I will 
discussed in very details. So you can scan the QR code. You 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 or you just key in my TCM dot my. So when you key in my TCM dot my, in this website you have three button. The first button is a COVID content, close contact or COVID nineteen patient. And second is about the you uh, someone is in the red zone. And the third, the green one is a discharge for a discharge COVID nineteen patient. So in, in this one, we, the, the public need to upload the time, image, and fill out all the particulars and answer all the questions and agree to our term and condition. And also then after that, you can do the submission. So uh, I will let you know about the flaw, how we do it in the back end. So when we receive the applications, we have an I account. I account is a CMEC member. So we have I account, C account, and S account. All these kind of account, we must have a confidential list undertaken. Uh, so this is, we, we are trying our best to protect all the data from our public. And for our account, they will call the patients or the call the applicants and then ask and then confirm all the information. After that, we the I account will give a prescription and then sometimes we'll do the follow up. After that, the application was sent to the C account. So C account will approve for the prescriptions or comment or reject the prescription. If this is fine, it's just okay. And then approve the prescription. Then after that, this information applicants, the form will be sent to the S account. So S account is our supporting partner. So which is uh, at, in East Malaysia, uh, West Malaysia, we have more than uh, 1515 our supporting partner. So right now we serve uh, all Malaysians through the West and East Malaysia. And also in recently, there have some Singaporean also using our platform, then we help them. So we send our prescription sent to our supporting partner in Singapore. Uh, that our supporting partner help us to prepare the Chinese herbs for the COVID-19 patient in Singapore. So this is our flaw. Uh, we, using I, C, and S account, our flow to serve for the public. So this is, when, when, when you log into this uh, a website, when you click the first page, we will tell you what kind of herbal we will prescribe to you. So it's very clear. Uh, if you have, if you're asymptomatic, what kind of uh, herbs we will prescribe to you? If you have a uh, cough, what kind of thing we will give you? So this is the first page. And the second page, you, you need to upload one tongue photo. You just click upload photo and then uh, select the photo of your tongue, then just click, click next. Well, in the next, we, we need to you answer all the questions. Your name, your age, uh, your height, your weight. And then the more important is telephone number. You must key in correctly because we will call you and then your email. And also address, uh, we our address, we, we can't send our uh, herbal tea or Chinese herbs to you. So this is a, a very important thing. And then after that, we will ask you all about the COVID-19 questions. Do you have a fever? Do you have been close contact with anybody who is test positive uh, with COVID-19 recently? Do you have a call? How about a phlegm, uh, the color of phlegm? Do you have a sonar of rave and do you have a soft true? So this all about the COVID-19. And after that, we will also ask you, uh, do you have a right here? How about uh, vomiting? Do you feel tired? How about your sense of smell, your test? And then how about the SBO2, your heartbeat and blood pressure? After that, we will ask about the question from the view of TCM. How about your mood and uh, your, your emotions? And how about your sleeping quality? How about your appetite? How about your energy? And how about your urine and stool? So, uh, this is the, and the question from the TCM. We will get this kind of information to know about your body condition. So after that, we will ask you other questions for the clinical survey. Do you have any asthma or diabetes or your high blood pressure or CD or G6PD or any other uh, medical history? So then what is a G6PD? Many people will ask what is G6PD? G6PD it's a uh, its body doesn't have enough of an enzyme, so we call this PD. Because this is PD, they are uh, some of the uh, Chinese herbs cannot be used for the this PD uh, patients. 
uh, maybe they, they will have a side effect uh, from a G6PD. So we were asked about this one. So we, when we look for, this is a G6PD patients. So one or two or some of the uh, Chinese herbs, we won't prescribe for G6PD. So after that, we will ask you about, uh, do I use mucal and how about the, the test of uh, COVID-19? So what type of uh, COVID-19 test you have been done? So answer all these kind of questions. Then after that, this is the last page is about our disclaimer. Just read all the disclaimer and then you just click, I agree. And then key in your uh, IC number or passport number as your e signature. So this is our form. And then I will, I will share with you about our back end. So we look for this one, this is our account. So I, uh, so I account, we have a name, age, uh, general race and then uh, phone number. The phone number we also cover the five digits uh, between uh, your your full set of uh, phone number and then address and email and then the date of uh, submissions and then uh, from the red zone or their coordinating patients. Yeah. So this is uh, our account. Then after that, our account uh, we will look. This is our uh, our back end information. So we can look yes or no, yes or no. Yeah. And then we also can, oh, okay, how about your emotion? How about your sleep, sleeping quality? Or we, we will have a, this kind of idea. Then, yeah. So when you did the COVID-19, how about the result? Yeah. So what type of uh, COVID-19 test uh, you have been done? So we have, we, we have this kind of, all the information inside our hand. After that, also we have uh, the image of a tongue. Then we will describe the herbs for this particular patient. After that, we will choose, depends on the address. If they are independent, so we maybe we will choose our Northern I, uh, S account partner help us to prepare and distribute the herbs. So this is a I account. Then after that, we look for this one. Uh, this is from uh, C account. So this is the, we look for this one, record. We will depends on your IC number, we will know when you do the submission, first submission and second submission, so we will compare and then we will click and look for the previous description. Is this work for you? And then how about your previous uh, time presentation? So we have, we're using this platform to keep all the information about the patient. So I will say two cases uh, about the COVID-19. So this is uh, 20 years old, the meals is tested uh, positive in 13th of May this year. So day one, cough, so through this kind of problem. And day one, start to use Chinese herbs and look for day two. And day three, the cough is a total re relief and the so true is 60%. And the day five, oh, okay. And day nine, all symptom relief. And in the day 11, go to the lab and then do another test the result is negative. So this is the first one. So we look for this one. So for the TCM, we, uh, you know, TCM we use, we will ask a question, then we will, sometimes we'll hurt or smell, and then we will use the uh, pulse taken, and also we we'll look for the tongue. So in the communicable disease, the tongue is more important from a view of TCM, because we can get more and more information from the tongue. So this is one kind of method we must, get the photo of the tongue from the COVID-19 patient. So we look for the second one. Second one is a 29 years old females, test positive, uh, positive in uh, July. Uh, I think they because the fever, 37.3. Then this is day, day three, she submit application for us. So we, we send five, I think three to five days, Chinese subs. In the day number eight, you look for the tongue presentation. It's a, obviously a significant difference between day three and day eight. So this is very important uh, presentations, time photo for our team to understand the condition of the COVID-19 patient. So uh, until today, we have more than 6,000 uh, applicants through our online form or our mytcm.my uh, to apply. Uh, for the Chinese herbs from us. So it's a more than 5,000 of a close, uh, close contact COVID-19 patients or patient or discharge patient. So this is approximately 65% is 
is a CAT2 patient. And this is about 8% uh, is a CAT1 patient. It's about 14% is a CAT3 and 4 patients, uh, stage patient. And it's about 13% of a discharge patients using our platform. And then uh, we try our best to help them. And majority is from the Kangaroo. And also we have from the South, is of North Malaysia. So this is our information about uh, African. So conclusions. Well, we are trying our best to work with others, uh, professionals or overseas experts. And we are trying also learn using the IT. So interactions, innovation and integrations. So we come out the guidelines, safety and practice guidelines, and then we involve many young TCM practitioners in all kinds of TCM activity with COVID-19. And also we using TCM telemedicine and we serve more than 6,000 applicants. And then we go to the, uh, bring the TCM service to the PKRCS. And also we have publication. The third version is, uh, uh, is published from in the journals of uh, uh, University of Beijing University of TCM. I, I think in this month, we have another publication we'll talk about the challenges of a TCM in Malaysia, uh, using TCM Malaysia uh, for the COVID-19. I think this month, November, we will come up a new publication and also research right now, uh, CMEC, Utah, and then we work with the Namahi Hospital and also Tongsin Hospital. And with uh, MOH, we work together. We have one uh, research project we call uh, Reservoir Practice of the TCM's Treatment for the COVID-19. Uh, for COVID-19 in Malaysia. So we are trying our best to promote TCM to let the people know about the TCM and COVID-19 and then we try our best to provide this kind of a safety and practice uh, guideline for our TCM personnel and also TCM practitioner to let them know more and more uh, how to help the people using this kind of a guideline. So this is my reference and uh, I think the time is uh, okay. So this is my YouTube and my Facebook. You can scan and then uh, can look for my uh, video, uh, always about uh, COVID-19 and uh, TCM and some knowledge about the TCM, how to understand about the TCM. Yeah, thank you so much, Tansri. Thank you very much, uh, Professor T. Uh, so far, there is one question. Mm. The participant asked, uh, how do we know whether we have G6PD problem or not? Okay, uh, normally G6PD patients, sometimes they are not suitable to use for the beans product. When use this kind of a thing, they have uh, some problems, uh, uh, especially in the, in the child, they have uh, this kind of a uh, problem, especially for using to consume some herbal product or other product, they have uh, some, uh, uncomfortable and then maybe the blood uh, disorder, this kind of a problem. Uh, I think they have uh, one kind of a test you can go uh, to the hospital to do this kind of test, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, any other questions? We are not receiving questions on this TCM section because I think many people uh, don't either they they already know or they don't know enough to ask okay but uh, anyway i i think we uh, because of time i would like to move on to mr low and then come back to you uh, prof uh, prof t if there are questions coming in uh, yeah uh, and then uh, after mr low uh, we will ask uh, we will invite uh, tan sri andrew to also say a few words uh, to round up, okay. So may I now introduce uh, Mr. Lo Lin Ho, uh, who has been the executive director of the uh, uh, Hawaii Hospital uh, for twenty two years now, huh? okay. And uh, he has been the chairman of the hospital's TCM coordinating and managing uh, committee, okay. Uh, so he has quite a bit of experience in handling uh, the uh, management of TCM programs in Lam Hua E. So over to you, uh, Lin Ho. Okay. Hi. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me start the 
share the screen. So good evening, everyone. I'm Lo Lian Ho from CMD, the Chinese Medicine Division of Lam Hua Yi, a not-for-profit charitable society founded nearly 140 years ago in 1883 in Penang. The three main objectives of the hospital are one, to render medical service to general public irrespective of race and religion. Two, to render free medical treatment to destitute patients. Three, to sponsor and undertake research, teaching, training of personal, medical personnel. These are the three objectives of the hospital. And today, my talk, I will cover the, the following, the treatment, the post-COVID rehabilitation, and the preventive measure. Uh, first, on the treatment, uh, due to the increasing positive COVID cases in Penang in March this year, we decided to establish an online uh, TCM consultation panel with our six of our senior to, Yi Si is the term I use to call our Chinese physician. But, uh, actually, the meaning is, is the same, is a doctor. We do we go online is because the, at that time, a lot of patients cannot uh, see us in the clinic because of uh, government restriction. So they are either uh, being hospitalized once they are confirmed uh, COVID patient, they will be uh, or go under the quarantine uh, in a home at home or in the COVID hotel. So we have to go online to, to do all these things. There are six uh, ISU, uh, our senior ISU. Uh, the head of the panel uh, is Chen uh, Jianglan ISU. Ling Li Chi Yi Si, Yap Tio Lin Yi Si, Leong Kian Shi Yi Si, Pak Ma Tai Yi Si, and Tan Gim Seng Yi Si, an assistant by a medical assistant, Go Yen Ping Yi Si. Our online consultation the hotline is 017-993-1877. This is an uh, important number for you to remember. If you ever come across any COVID patient, you can call us. How we go about doing the, uh, this uh, online consultation? The suspect or uh, diagnosed COVID patient can contact us through either calling our number, just now I, I given the number, SMS or WhatsApp us by leaving their names the date of confirmation for contacting COVID uh, contact numbers. Then uh, our medical assistant, Ms. Go, uh, or Go Isu, would call back and get the patient's uh, information, including uh, their, na their name, age, gender, main signs and symptoms, then uh, a company signs or other symptoms, date of confirmed uh, diagnosis for COVID and the venue of hospitalization or quarantine and the clinical stage if they know. We would then uh, also ask the patient for her or his uh, blood pressure reading, the pulse rate, the SpO2 reading, body weight, height, uh, pregnant, pregnancy stage, if available. But the most important uh, is that we want to get some picture of the, the tongue, the patient's tongue. So they can either take a picture and send it to us. As uh, mentioned, that just sounds like proof day. For Chinese medicine, it's very important to see the condition of the tongue. Then the information we collected, we will pass to the panel for online consultation. And uh, herbal medication were prescribed and forward to our dispensary for preparation. A three-day medication will prepare. Uh, this consists of six vacuum-packed uh, decaution. 
uh, the, um, to be taken one pack each in the morning, another pack in the evening, one hour after meal. Normally, the patient's family uh, member or the uh, arrangement with a grab rider, uh, they will come to our clinic and collect the decaution after making a payment of 61 ringgit for the medical charges, we charge a flat rate of 61 ringgit per consultation. Payment, it can be made by cash or they can also make online uh, through our Maybank account or touch and go uh, facility. Then the patient will call the he or her again for daily progress. And on the fourth day, for a repeated, repeated uh, consultation and further med medication if necessary. And again, on the sixth day. And uh, depend on the patient's uh, overall condition, normally the patient should be recovered within a week or so. Okay, I, here I give you some uh, figure the, from our experience. The patient uh, normally only take uh, three days uh, herbs medication uh, after the first consultation and they will be recovered. Uh, that uh, constitute our 37.8% of our patients uh, so far. Some take two, uh, two uh, take six, six days uh, herbs, that's uh, two consultation and that con it consists of 20.2% of our patient, and some take seven days. Why they take seven days uh, medication is because some patient, because it's not convenient for them to take that, uh, so they prefer to take uh, a bit more, so they no need to come back to us. And this uh, contribute uh, to 3.3%. That means for after two consultations, uh, patient uh, is only 23.5%. Uh, uh, 20, and those need three consultations, that means seven days uh, medication, uh, nine days medication consists of 16% of our patients so far. And for those more than uh, 10 days, that means they have to see us to, uh, for consultation for more than three times. It consists of 22.7%. So as you can see, it's only 22.7% uh, of patients uh, required uh, more than three consultations. That means uh, more than 10 days. Basically, most patients is recovered within uh, a week or seven, seven days. Okay, okay I, I, I quote some cases. Case one <coughs> is a, a Chinese boy uh, 14 years old, he was tested uh, positive on September 18, uh, home quarantine, and he cannot take uh, uh, the body temperature or blood pressure because they don't have the he don't have the equipment at home to do so. As the, just now, Antonio the uh, mentioned, it's important to have some of this basic. Uh, uh, equipment like a uh, thermometer, SpO2 to uh, test uh, ox oximeter. So he, he, his symptom is a uh, fever and aversion to cold, uh, dry throat and thirsty. So the, uh, after first three days, uh, the decaution, uh, his uh, fever very relief. Uh, aversion to cold also relief, still got sore throat, uh, and dry throat and thirsty, uh, tiredness, and loss of appetite. Uh, now they can, he can start taking some small uh, amount of food. Uh, and stomach bloating, nausea, insomnia, uh, the orange, uh, relief. He can now uh, sleep better. So diarrhea is also relief. So, but uh, he take another uh, three days uh, decaution uh, medication, and basically he recover. 
he can now the uh, no more fever, uh, no more the uh, aversion to cold, uh, dry throat, uh, less uh, tiredness, uh, loss of uh, appetite. Uh, now he can eat very well already, and basically uh, it's considered as uh, recovered. His two is a male to India, uh, 47 years old. Uh, this one is a more serious case. Uh, his uh, category was considered as uh, category four and tested on August 24th. And, uh, he got symptoms of uh, insomnia, that, uh, choking when he's drinking, dry throat, Weakness of lower limbs, lassitude or tiredness, uh, shortness of breath, aggravate when moving, and sent, uh, loss of uh, sense of taste and smell. So after taking uh, three days uh, medication, some other of the symptoms already recovered. Uh, and after taking six days of the medication, he was able to sleep well already. And uh, that, uh, no more choking uh, when drinking. Uh, dry throat still persists uh, occasionally. And uh, weakness of uh, lower limbs. Uh, now he's able to sit up on his own. And tiredness, uh, now he's feeling more energetic. And shortness of uh, breath uh, is uh, already gone. Uh, then the loss of sense of uh, taste and smell uh, already relief. You got back, okay. Case three is a Chinese uh, lady of 89 years old, tested positive on August 29. It's uh, uh, on home quarantine. And at that time, the body temperature is 37.7. And SpO2 is uh, quite good, uh, 98. But he got the symptom of fever, cough, with white phlegm, poor appetite, constipation for four days. Then after taking the medicine for three days, the fever already relieved. Yes, uh, the temperature go down to 37.2. And uh, cough uh, with white phlegm is reduced. The appetite improved and constipation sorry, relief. And after the second uh, visit to us, uh, I mean, but, but through online uh, consultation, the fever already gone. Uh, it's, it's tested at 36.8. And cough already relief. Uh, poor appetite uh, improved, it's back to normal. And constipation, uh, it's already uh, gone. So as you can see, uh, normally uh, is the, a patient will recover about uh, a week after taking TCM. So now let us talk about uh, post-COVID rehabilitation. Uh, it's very important to go for this because uh, this is what uh, we call long, long COVID, which is uh, quite serious. Uh, from the data we we collected is, is actually the, nearly the, most of the patient uh, the, having this long COVID because of the COVID, the, the internal organ, what we Chinese believe internal organ is already the, injured or damaged. So it's having the, a lot of problem. And uh, published in Nature the magazine that, uh, in March this year, it said uh, COVID patients which have long COVID and compared to normal uh, people, you have 60% higher risk of getting serious illness, even death. So the, for post-COVID uh, rehabilitation, the, we allowed the patient to come to our a clinic uh, 14 days after the first diagnosis with uh, COVID-19. Uh, Our ESA can really perform normal uh, consultation uh, through the four methods of TCM diagnosis, namely uh, one, that means by observation, uh, uh, 
one which uh, by smelling or by listening uh, or then the third one is by inquiry asking the patient a lot of questions just as uh, just now professor T already mentioned and uh, of course the most important because now we can see the patient we can also do the power feeling which is uh, one part uh, very important uh, diagnostic tools for for TCM so then we can have more accurate understanding of the patient and we will prescribe the better the medication as required. Okay. As at uh, October, the end of October, there were 144,847 people in Penang is diagnosed with COVID confirmed cases, of which 140,701 have since recovered. These are the people now we are the very the concerned that uh, because they might have long COVID. So the, I really hope that these people can come to pick the TCM helping and get them to better treat. And for uh, the prevention, still the best uh, preventive uh, action is getting vaccinated fully, uh, as the, what uh, Datonio has just now mentioned, and getting vaccinated with the third dose when available to you. You should not de decline it. And of course, wearing masks, maintaining the social distancing of at least one meter, uh, hand washing, follow SOP, and avoid uh, clouded places. So for prevention, we have the three types of uh, Chinese herbs that, uh, to help uh, the public. We have one, it's a Fang Yi Xiang Nang, and two is a Zhen Qi Ying, and third is a Qi Huo Zhen Qi Tang. Fang Yi Xiang Nang basically is a, a fragrant sachet. We, we sell at four ringgit per sachet. Uh, why I want to mention the, the price? Because we don't want the public to go to other places to buy it and they, they might be cheated at a higher cost. So the, we are selling at four ringgit per sachet. This you can put in your handbag or in your backpack or inside the car. Uh, fragrance uh, will help to relieve and uh, prevent uh, bacteria, virus. And it's actually some claim that it can also help to, uh, to get rid of the mosquito, which I, I, I don't think so. Then the second, uh, it's a uh, tea bag. That, uh, um, it contains six uh, herbs, Chinese herbs. That, uh, and we pack it uh, in a uh, bag of five tea bags and selling at 10 ringgit per pack. So similarly, this is uh, just a drink, tea drink. So it will help to raise the immunity. And lastly, is the our most popular the medication, uh, the preventive medication. It's the qi huo zhen qi tang. It's in uh, vacuum packed uh, decoction for easy consumption. You just uh, warm it up and pair and drink. It contains uh, eight types of uh, Chinese herbs. And <clears throat> The decaution can promote uh, body immunity against bacteria or virus infection. So normally, you take one pack in the morning and another pack in the evening after meal. So the one course is consists of uh, 14 bag costs uh, for one week uh, uh, consumption. And we sell it at 84 ringgit uh, per pack for one week cost. So this is the most uh, popular product uh, we have to sell. I, we actually, I even received some the people that say that uh, his son is a doctor in a government hospital. And because he take this uh, decaution, and he's the only one in the section uh, that didn't get COVID, whereas his colleagues uh, got COVID. So I think uh, this, uh, actually, I think it can work uh, for times uh, TCM actually is, is good. 
So uh, my talk, uh, I, uh, I will end here. That, uh, it's a very short talk uh, because uh, I think just now the Dr. Neo and Professor T, they have already uh, give you a very clear uh, information on COVID uh, and on uh, TCM. So uh, now I'm open to question. Thank, okay. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Low. Yeah. Uh, there are two questions uh, posed to you, okay. just posed only. Okay. Um, where can we buy or order the product? Okay, you can uh, actually get from our Chinese medicine division, the builder, yeah. and get it from the counter. Right, but then uh, if uh, there's a question, uh, someone from Singapore yes. asking how to get it, if he's Singapore, he's in Singapore or KL, you know, not in Penang. Okay, actually, I have a lot of inquiries from, from other states. And we provide just now, we provide you the, the prescription. Mm -hmm. You can buy it from anywhere because uh, we are not selling this uh, at a profit. We are actually selling at loss. You see, uh, because we are a non profit uh, the hospital. So we are doing the charity. So the, we, we give you just now, Eric uh, has uh, published the, the, the formula. You right. can buy it from, from the any. Chinese medicine uh, herb, herbal shops uh, and get them to uh, do it for you. Although the cost might be higher, especially in Singapore. Okay. All right, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. There are now a few questions uh, for Professor T. First question, uh, Professor T, is uh, what is the view of TCM on Western vaccine, Western medicine's vaccine? Okay. Uh, okay. Let me share a slide. Okay, this is a slide. Uh, I have uh, some talk about the TCM and uh, uh, communicable disease. So, um, actually, TCM they have an uh, idea of vaccinations. I think few hundred years ago. This is a small pox. Pox. How TCM doing this kind of thing? Actually, this technique is from China through the Turkey and Russia, and then go to the Europe, and then England. And after that, they have a modern vaccinations, then through the Macau, and then uh, go into the China. So this is a smallpox. So example, if I have a smallpox, I will get other people to wear my shirt. So this is a, a one kind of a idea for the vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, another one, uh, they use the fruit of uh, the pork uh, doing the superficial scratch. This is uh, another one kind of uh, technique to, do, to use in that time. And after that, they have another safety method to do so. They use the uh, small pork scraps powder and then, and then after use for the children or other people. So this happened in the few uh, 100 years ago in China. So this is one kind of uh, Western nations, but it is not in the modern technique. So TCM actually is uh, have an idea of a Western nation and we also support the Western nation. Yeah, so this is the first one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, the concept of vaccination uh, has also started in TCM before, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, the Western medicine has taken up, uh, taken it to a much higher level in a very scientific way, right? So uh, TCM is not against vaccination. In fact, just now, uh, Mr. Low also recommended uh, that everybody should get vaccinated, right? Now, um, the other question to you is, uh, is there any TCM treatment for category five patients who are already under intubation in the ICU? Uh, yes, in our protocol, yes. In China, also, yes. And we have one, one experience to provide the Chinese herbs for the Cat5 COVID-19 patient in Malaysia. Uh, in the morning, the Western medicine say cannot uh, apply, uh, use TCM any drug from TCM. But in the afternoon, 
I think the condition is uh is is very bad. Then the doctor allowed to use with uh, TCM. Then we use the drug in our protocol. Uh, we try our best to last the life for another five days. But unfortunately, um, it's, it's very hard because it's already in the cat fight already. So from my idea, please FD Lee to do any treatment, maybe from Western or Chinese medicine, medicine for cat one and cat two don't let the COVID-19 go to the cat three four five this is very trouble yeah yeah okay right thank you um well i think that's about all uh, let, let me double check because there's questions that came in directly into my phone uh, and from another friend you know Sorry. Okay. yes can I uh, add uh, some yes. comments about this uh, G6PD? Okay, sure. Uh, uh, G6PD, actually, uh, I mean, in Malaysia now, most of the baby, I mean, they're born in the hospital, uh, doctor will do a G6PD test. They be informed whether they uh, yes. the got this G6PD uh, problem. Okay. Uh, G6PD uh, to our Chinese medicine, we are quite uh, concerned because it can uh, uh, affect the, some of our uh, Chinese herbs. Okay, uh, uh, but I have a question for you uh, that just came in, uh, Mr. Lo. Yeah. Um, the, the question is about the Xiang Nan that you talked uh, talk yes. about, uh, yes. uh, hanging in the car and all that. Yes, yes. Uh, how long can it last, actually? Okay, the, normally, the, I, I would suggest you keep it for about a month or so, not longer than that. Although a lot of people still keep it because it can just give a very nice smell if you like uh, Chinese herbs. Okay. Yeah. You won't get addicted to it, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we have covered almost all questions because some of the questions directed uh, to Dr. Neil uh, have already been answered uh, just now in the chat group uh, by, the, by the team uh, after consulting Dr. Neil because we're worried about timing, okay? So uh, between the three of you, would you like to ask each other questions? Uh, no. Huh? <laughs> I think anybody can ask questions, you know, not only the three of us, right? Right, right, right. Right. Amongst the three of you, I mean, we ask each other. Since we have a little bit of time, we want a, a fight. <laughs> uh, how, can, how can I fight when I'm sitting on all three uh, so-called <laughs> faces? <laughs> Who am I going to fight against myself? Yes, no, yes. But I, I think it's important, yes. you know, for, yeah. this, uh, for this conference that we point out that there are alternatives uh, for people who are getting COVID or even are worried they're going to get COVID. Now, I think one of the most fundamental principles of human life is hope, you know. So that's the problem. What I didn't like about the original um, way we deal with COVID is that when we somebody has COVID, we just tell them, go home and wait. Wait for what? Wait to see whether it gets worse. Unfortunately, 20 over percent of people who died waited too long and they died at home. That is tragic, you know. So there's no hope, you know, there. So what I think these Chinese medicines are doing to a certain extent is to give people hope, you know, that there's some medicine you can take home to take. You don't have to wait, wait at home and wait for what? Tan si ya. Wait, to, sorry. wait to die or wait to live or what? Wait for what? So this is, I think, the problem with the original way we approach. We have to take the humanistic approach to this. We can't just simply tell people to go home and wait. This is the wrong thing. We have to give them something, you know, give them some hope. I think that's very important. And that's where the Chinese medicine has a role to play. Or not even Chinese medicine, any complementary medicine that has some proven efficacy can be used, yeah. right? So early COVID, you have no treatment, okay. Take this help. Maybe it will help, maybe you won't. But at least you're giving something, you're trying something. But 5,000 years of clinical history, 
in China, I think they understand, right? Some of the herbs which are being used, herbal formula, uh, the Qingfei Bai Du Tang, is 2,000 years old, right? The Chinese understand pathogen 2,000 years ago. So I, I think giving hope is very important. That's, that's my only comment, yeah. Sure, okay. So uh, we, we are coming almost to the end. Um, well, if anyone has any question, quick question, please type it in the chat box because we, we, we cannot uh, meet, uh, allow people to you know, come in to participate. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be very difficult to manage. Now still with almost 200 participants listening. I hope you understand, okay? So anyway, um, is there any other comment? Um, uh, I, I think oh, that uh, is from from yeah. Fung. Yes, okay. Uh, Andrew? Yes, Andrew. No, there's, a, there's a hands up from Miss Ho Mi Fung. Yes, I know. But I'm asking her to, to type, uh, type in the question rather than to, to, to un, unmute her, see? Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, it's not easy to control. Rather, people start racing. Okay, okay uh, uh, actually, can I just make one comment? I forgot sure. at the beginning of the talk to say clearly that I, I do not endorse any special brand of, of medication or herbs or vitamins or minerals or whatever. I don't, I don't, yeah. I always tell people, yeah, most of these are the same thing anyway. So whether you buy the most expensive or cheapest, the same. So any brand will do, but go for standardization, right? You have to buy standardized uh, medicine and herbs. You can't just buy vitamin C without knowing the amount. So mm -hmm. same thing, you cannot buy Ling Tzu without knowing how much uh, polysaccharide uh, is in it. You know? So buy standardized herbs or medicine, but I don't endorse any brand. And I don't endorse any uh, hospital as well. You know, I, I don't say that Lam E is good or whatever. I think all uh, hospitals and clinics are essentially good. So it's more important to go and see a doctor or yi shi when you're ill. Mm. Don't, don't, don't say that, oh, that one in, uh, you know, all the way to go to, to, to KL to see somebody, no. But that's not important. I think it's important to see somebody, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, uh, may I invite uh, Andrew to make some concluding remarks or even raise questions if you want to? So I think uh, after two, nearly two and a half hours, I think uh, our capacity to have attention to such a wealth of information from three great speakers um, who have spoken passionately uh, about uh, what they feel very strongly about based upon their own personal experience and their own contributions to the field. I think Dr. Neo put it very, very well. Um, you know, traditional medicine is an alternative. It's not either or, you can have and. And the way you approach this is that if, if, if you feel and you believe that it will help you, it may help you and it sometimes will. So uh, the whole idea of this webinar is to spread the knowledge of what we uh, that means, you know, the uh, uh, Lamwai Hospital, uh, Uta Hospital, uh, and experts like uh, uh, Dr. Neo from Sun Sun Group uh, have tried to contribute to all our public knowledge in this time of great confusion and great tragedy. Uh, we want to give you all hope. And we want you to know that there are many people who are out there who can help you? Now, the advice that we give you are general. This is public information that we want to share with you. But if you feel ill, uh, please accept all the standard operating procedures and advice from the government. Go and see your doctor, go and see your hospital. But if you feel that you want to have a little bit of preventive and you want to consult your sincere or your you know, uh, 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 traditional Chinese medicine, please feel free to do so. And we hope that if you keep an open mind, you know, it will help you and help your family. And in that regard, I think the advice of the government in this area is, you know, lindung diri, lindung semua. We protect ourselves and we protect everyone. 
And that is the difference to a large extent between Western and in that sense, traditional philosophy, because the COVID is an enemy, but we cannot kill the enemy. We have to live with it. And the issue about the enemy is not just about the COVID, but about ourselves, because we are the ones who are getting infected. And if we ourselves get infected, our family and our friends can get infected. So if you protect yourself, you know, you understand yourself, you help yourself, you in a sense, help the community. We hope you find this uh, webinar very useful. This is the public service that we all want to do in the jo Georgetown Institute and Wawasan Open University, UTA, Lamwayi Hospital, and you know, thanks to the contributions from the Sun Sun Group. So on that note, I want to thank the three speakers for their time, but most of all, I want to thank Dan Sri Ko for moderating this and leading this effort. And to all of you who spent more than two and a half hours of your valuable email to join us in this hopefully very useful effort. Thank you very much and good night. Yes, and thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Sun Bin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof T. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lo. And thank a big thank you to the whole team. They are helping from behind uh, on many things. And uh, we hope that we will be able to bring uh, more webinars like this to you uh, in the future. Uh, please contact us. Uh, through all the uh, contact uh, numbers and all that given and uh, go on our website uh, we have information there uh, for you and if there's any issue uh, write to us uh, through the email address uh, that are available so thank you very much good night stay safe stay sane and keep in touch thank you Good night, thank you. Good night, good night.